associate deans in the College of Arts and Sciences. But David is a faculty member in the Department of Communication Studies here at Texas Tech. He teaches a lot about communication skills and about how do you persuade people, how do you have a dialogue with people. He also, for those of you who go to Tech, he is the voice of graduation for the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> <laughs> and in announcing those, you know, a couple thousand names that come through in terms of David, I think you'll find David's. Uh, he has some really good ideas. He has some exercises that he'll deal with you. Um, but communication is one of David's passions, and how do we communicate effectively? So, thank you, David, for being. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I feel very blessed not only to be in this group here today, uh, but also just to be in the job that I'm in. I'm an academic. I get paid for learning. I get paid for sharing what I think I know. You know, with other people, and I thought, what a job! I get to sit in my office and talk to scholars like Dr. John Zach, and I'll say, you know, I know this is thing growing on the top of my skin. And will it kill me? Or whatever. <laughs> and he can tell me those things, and I ask him, which mushroom should I eat? And he says, well, don't eat the ones like this. And I thought, where else? What other environment can you be in where we get to learn? be paid to learn. You get to hang around other people who are insane about knowing more and learning more. Uh, and I think, what a, what a neat opportunity to, to have that. I'm very humbled to be in this room uh, because I know that we have scholars from all different kinds of disciplines in here. A lot of art scientists, I hear we even have a philosopher in the room. How marvelous. Uh, I'm more from the social sciences. So I'm a number cruncher. I do research on how People do social things, particularly communication. So if you'll notice from your schedule today, there's going to be three sessions on it, at least three, on communication in science. And I'm going to look more at the persuasion. John and I have talked several times about communicating with people. How do you get people to listen to you? What do you do if they do not agree with you? How do you still communicate uh, with people? So I'm going to look, take more of a persuasion focus. Uh, Dr. Hassel and Dr. Hayhoe will take a little bit different focus that will probably be even more specific to some of the research that you're doing uh, in that regard. So we're going to take a little bit of a look at, you know, particularly with a specific topic, we're going to look at a specific topic today, but it's going to be more broad strokes such that you could use this not only with this topic, uh, but with other topics as well. Uh, you know, it may not be to you, but it is to some people, this could be a controversial topic, couldn't it? <laughs> could it not? Could there be more than one perspective on this particular topic? So as we go through today, I want us to look at three questions, and I'll show you what those are in just a bit. But I want us to look at those three questions in the context of this particular topic, because I think perceive that most of you are in here because you're interested in that particular topic. Here's one perspective on that particular topic. You look at these and you see what you think. <laughs> ah. I'm looking at your reaction. <laughs> what about this perspective? That's another perspective, isn't it? On the exact same topic. And it's because this particular topic in terms of climate change does, does elicit some different perspectives. And so one of the things as we go through today, I want you to keep the fact that this topic could have different perspectives on it. In mind as we go through and talk about how could you be in a persuasive type of way, knowing that some people laughed at the first at the cartoons and then decided like, the room got a little bit more cold when we got to the second group of topics as I as I thought that it might. So I want us to look at three rhetorical questions, if you will. Uh, that have to do with dealing with this topic when you're presenting your research, when you're talking about this with other people. Uh, three specific 
areas that I want us to think about. And with each one of these areas, I'd like to introduce some rhetorical theory, some rhetorical principles that come out of research. Uh, so this is not just a wouldn't it be loverly kind of, kind of presentation. I want us to actually do the research that backs some of the comments that we're going to look at. We're going to look at when you're trying to deal in a persuasive situation, one of the things you need to think about is who's coming to this party and what are they bringing with them? Okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more in a minute. Why would these people listen to you giving a persuasive topic, particularly taking the position that you're taking? Why would they listen to you? All right? And then I also want to talk about what if they not just a little bit disagree, what if they really disagree, all right? So those are the particular areas I want us to look at, and we're going to look at communication and rhetorical theory and principles for each one of these, and so I hope you can gain something that you can find useful uh, in that regard. Let's look at the first one. Who's at the party? I'm speaking metaphorically here. Bottom line, we're talking about who is your audience? Who is your audience, and what did they come to your presentation with what baggage did they bring with them? What equipment? What food? Intellectual food did they bring with them? What did they bring to your party? Well, you say, well, before we get into what they brought, let's think a little bit about what is persuasion. We have to look at that before we think about who's at the party, right? So persuasion. Hmm. Persuasion is the process of trying to change people's attitudes, their values, and or their beliefs. That's pretty serious stuff, right? Persuasion, you're trying to change their attitudes, things they like, things they don't like, their beliefs, things that they believe this is, this isn't, a view of reality, I believe this, I don't believe that, or their value systems, what is right, what is true, what is just, what is virtuous, that goes down deep, deep into my heart. So sometimes people will try to persuade in those particular domains as well. All right, so with that in mind, then let's look and see who comes to the party and what they might come with. Somebody asked me, where were you raised? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Texas. Some unique things about grew up in Texas that aren't probably specific to everybody in this room. Let me just hear where some of you are from. I read some of the program. I know we have some people from Indiana. Where else are you from? Back from the room, I talk about rulers. <laughs> right? Where else are you from? England. England! Oh, <laughs> the oh. Well, can anybody beat that in terms of distance? <laughs> wow, you get the prize. Everybody buy her supper. Everybody did this. Nepal! Oh, 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 that's pretty far away as well. Yes, right? Where else? China, yes. Wow, I didn't realize we were as international as we were. We're from all over the world. That's wonderful. Where else? Everybody else from Texas? <laughs> Everybody else shy? We're up in front. Minnesota. We think it's cold in Lubbock. It is not. It is not cold in Lubbock. It's a little word called Duluth that I've heard before. Yes. All right. Where else? Oregon, beautiful place, Oregon. Yes. All right, and the rest of you are shy. Okay, well, we'll find out afterwards. We may have some sessions where you actually get to share that. Have you ever noticed that people do things differently in different places? I went from Texas, and in Texas, everybody's supposed to be real friendly, and you greet people on the street, and you say howdy and whatever. And I went to New York City. And I'm seeing people on the subway. Hey, how's it going? And they're reaching for their guns. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way we do things up there. They don't, you don't say anything to strangers. You walk on by. People have different cultural norms. People have different cultural myths. When I grew up, I was always told by my parents, once you eat, as you just have, you can't go swimming for 30 minutes. I heard an hour. <laughs> <laughs> or if you do, what will happen? You will die. You get out the middle of the water and something will happen. They never made that quite clear what would happen. But you'll sink to the bottom like a rock, right? And so that was a cultural myth that I grew up with. I still don't know if it's true or not. I always wait for at least 30 minutes before I go swimming after I've eaten. 
And so you see, people come from different places. They have different cultural norms. They have different, sometimes different beliefs, belief systems in terms of what is polite, what isn't polite, what is a custom here, what is not a custom there. Well, I'm saying one way. <laughs> so, but you need to know if you're trying to persuade somebody, you need to know from whence they come, do you not? You need to know as much about what are their current belief systems? What are they thinking in terms of their attitudes or their values or their beliefs towards your particular topic? I'd, I'd like first to jot some things right down real quickly. I'm going to divide you into two halves of the room. On this half of the room, I'd like for you to tell me three attitudes or values or beliefs that uh, someone might have toward science in general. Anybody? Three, yes. Or somebody that you might be dealing with at some point. You might be presented to in your own country, in your own state, or whatever. What are three attitudes or three beliefs or three values towards science in general that you might encounter? All right. Over here, I'm going to let you be even more specific. I'd like for you to jot down in your notes somewhere three attitudes, three values, three beliefs that somebody might have where you might be speaking toward climate change specifically. Attitudes, values, or beliefs that you might encounter. Okay, be quiet. What you think? Right. Three. Anybody need more time? They do. Can they get their time I'll let you start. I'd like for you to turn to your neighbor and share those, particularly in the context of giving a present scientific presentation. Maybe not to every scientist. Maybe politicians, to the media, to the general local population. Okay, so if you would share those uh, with the person sitting next to you, just tell them what you need. Okay. As soon as you get your three, if you will, someone next to you, let's pull up next to a friend and share with them what you might have. Right. Right.
to share a persuasive message that might actually hit. If you think about it, attitudes, values, and beliefs are kind of like concentric circles. Attitudes, what we like and dislike is kind of on the outside, and that's pretty much the easiest to change what somebody likes and they don't like. Remember the food that you used to like as a child that you hate now, or the food that you hated as a child, and you think, oh, that's pretty good actually now. And so you eat it now. Attitudes are easier to change, particularly if you put chocolate on it. <laughs> Whatever it is, put chocolate on it. Oh, you can change that attitude. <laughs> Beliefs are a little bit harder to change because that goes into what you think is and isn't. Is this bad? Is this bad for you? Is it not? That sort of thing. Uh, and so when you look at those things, those are a little harder to change. If you get down to somebody's fundamental values, which is at the center of the core, those are very hard. If somebody has a value system, that has a disagreement with whatever you're talking about, climate change or whatever, you're going to be very hard pressed to change that because that goes down to a very belief of what is right or wrong. Does that make sense? All right, so you have to keep those in mind. So making a list, you say, what, or what value was it for me to write these things down? Because if you're going to be a persuader, you're going to need to know this and do a lot more research than that into who it is that you're talking to. I want us to look at a particular uh, theory, uh, persuasion theory, called the social judgment theory. This still is talking about who's at the party and what are they bringing with them. This is a very interesting theory, and what it, it posits a lot of things, and it's a very complex theory. Uh, one, of what, one of the things it posits is that persuasion is a process. You don't just do it like switching on a light and switching off a light. A lot of times it's a long-term thing. Multiple messages multiple interactions and what have you. And so it will posit that. But it posits some other things that I that I wanted to share with you. Uh, within this theory, they look at people and they say, you know, from a social science perspective or from a persuasion perspective, there are at least three latitudes or ranges, and I drew them for you here. The one latitude on any topic, it doesn't matter if it's climate change or whatever it is, there will be one latitude of rejection. And this is where the person is rooted in that particular area. This is their predisposition towards your topic, all right? You see the people in the top there. You kind of get a clue what they think about things. <laughs> Whatever it is, all right? You're looking at that, and you can kind of get a clue. There's a range of that. Their position on climate change or whatever else might be rooted in there. Now, I will say this. It might be a rejection, but it might be kind of close to here. Or maybe way over there. It could be in a range. Not only your position might be in there, but any arguments you hear, you might say, well, that falls in my latitude of rejection. Or I really reject that, or I, I'm not sure about that. I sort of disagree with that one. So that's the latitude of rejection. There's a latitude of acceptance. Can you just do something for me? Can you just kind of go, oh, you ready? Oh. This is when you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> they agree with you. Oh. And you get in and you tell them your stuff, and they love what you say about climate change or whatever else it is. All right? They love that. This is the latitude of acceptance. Their basic position on the topic is in there. 
any arguments you hear that kind of go in this area, they put it in that box, all right? So then there's another latitude of non-commit, non-commitment, or neutral, or I flat don't care. I just don't care. Whatever it is, all right? Have you seen that perspective? In fact, you've seen all of them on climate change. Totally accept that. I don't really care about it or totally wrong, bonus, whatever, all right? So you've seen all of those. And you say, okay, if I'm going to try to persuade people, what is a reasonable expectation of myself in terms of my persuasion abilities? I teach classes on business communication, and one of the things that they're assigned to do is to do a persuasion speech. Persuasion presentation, typically in a business and professional setting. And they'll come up to me with their topics, and we'll do some audience analysis in the class, and they'll say, everybody in here is against what I'm saying, so that must be a bad persuasion topic. Well, depends on what it is you're trying to do. Are you trying to preach to the converted? Are you trying to reinforce people that already believe like you? Or are you trying to change them? And I tell them, no, that's not necessarily a persuasion topic, even if everybody in the room disagrees with you. It just may mean you need to approach it differently. What is reasonable? Is it reasonable to take somebody from way over here, reject, and by the end of your presentation, with your data, whatever it is, and then expect that they're going to end up over here. That happens every once in a while. <laughs> Usually there's a bright light with it and a whole changing of life and changing of how you dress and what you eat. That doesn't happen very often though, right? All right, so more often than not, you might say, well, somebody rejected this and I gave a persuasion speech and I moved them from here to here. They're still in the rejection zone, but I'm moving them from here to here. Or, like everybody vote, looks for in top political races in the United States, they're trying to go after those middle voters, right? So maybe they're right here, maybe I moved them from rejected, well, I don't know, but I don't care. All right, well maybe you move, any movement at all is persuasion, does that make sense? And if you contact them over and over, over a period of time, you may move them, you may not, all right? What if you move somebody from agree to disagree, or from here to here, or from here to there, or from here to there? Any movement at all is persuasion. Does that make sense? So you need to not be discouraged if you give a presentation and you don't say, well, they just left and I totally changed your life. That's, that's harder to do. It is hard to do. It can happen, but it's a lot harder to do. So when you think of the audience, you think, who came to the party? What did they bring with them? And you think, where are they on the range, and what is it reasonable for me to be able to accomplish the amount of contact that I'm going to have these people in? You know, frankly, we look at commercials all the time that they run all the time. And if we wanted to start singing jingles and stuff from commercials, I bet I could hum a few and you would go, it's that product, it's that product, it's that product. Do you all know those? Uh, no. But do you know what it is? Yes. So you've been exposed to it multiple times, multiple times, multiple times, right? So, Persuasion theory, social judgment theory is kind of cool, especially as you dig into it, especially as you think, okay, how can I persuade other people? Another question, why in the world would anybody, particularly your audience, want to listen to you? Why would they want to listen to you? Well, let's talk about it just for a second. Why would they not want to listen to you? Thoughts, comments, why would people not want to listen to you? Preconceived notions, and by the way, they're not the only ones that have preconceived notions, don't we all? But they may have some preconceived notions and say, uh, I'm going to go do something else instead. I'm going to listen to something else instead. You better believe it. Exactly right. What else? Yes, sir. Their interest? Their interest. I don't really care about that. Or I really care about that. All right? And so two different responses. You better believe the interest level and frankly if they're not interested part of your job as a persuader is to show them how to be interested and frankly most people are interested in something that affects them. And so say again. <laughs> That's true and I'm going to accept that as the most metaphorical <laughs> They would not want to listen to you if you are boring. All right, and that's the neat thing about higher ed. Even if you are boring, <laughs> but I hope you wouldn't want to do that. Don't, don't accept, don't embrace the boringness. <laughs> what if they didn't believe you, or they they lacked, they thought your sincerity wasn't there? 
because they, they have some doubts in those particular areas. So what is required for them to listen to you? The opposite of that, interest factors. Something that shows how this applies to me. Does it come by to me? I may not have confidence. If it applies to me, I'll listen to it. It interests me. It would benefit me. It's something that I could gain from. And another thing that might be, and this is the important rhetorical advice I want us to look at, is the concept of credibility. If you are not credible, nobody wants to hear you, right? And if you are, they want to hear you. Now tell me this, what is credibility? You know it when you see it, right? Let's try to define it. What is credibility? You know we want to get that as a persuasion. Right? How do you know if somebody's credible or not? Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. Can I trust this person to tell me the truth? Mm -hmm. Past experience. Past experience. Uh, yes, let's come to that one. Tell me more about what you mean by past experience. So, be able to whether this question was the word or the And that kind of ties into what you said verification? Reputation. Reputation. Okay, so that ties very well into that. Your qualifications, what is your degree in? Is your degree in food and nutrition and you're going to be a climate scientist? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe. Maybe that could be your hobby. But, and maybe you know all about it, but people are going to look at your vegan first. Ah, indeed. Practical application. Are you credible if you can show how that's practically applied? I had some colleagues when I worked at West Virginia University that actually did fact analysis on a variety of items designed to try and find out what is credibility. And people have been arguing about what it is in scientific. It's a multifaceted construct. So, yes, Tom. I was going to say what the general public often doesn't matter about your qualifications. Yes, it can. Do you they identify with you? Oh, you're so. Well, actually, you just gave the rest of my talk, so I'm going to sit down. You're so on. You're so on. When my, some colleagues of mine actually factor analyzed uh, doing some research on what is credibility, they kind of they kind of came up with a definition, and then they're going to come down to dimensions that you mentioned, right? According to this particular research and this defining uh, encapsulation of construct, credibility is the attitude that the audience has about you and about what you're talking about at any given time. It can switch. You can start out with credibility, by the time you get to the end, you're done. Or you can start out with no credibility and you have to build it. So it is a processal thing, but it's not something like, hey, I came to this talk today and I so came prepared because I bought a whole book of credibility on top It's something that they feel towards you, so you don't have it for that makes sense? So you say, well, what, what pieces of credibility exist? Well, they factor analyze it down to basically two. I found another one up here, man, but I wanted to show you what they came up with. It said, bottom line, credibility, when you're trying to persuade somebody, you want to know what your character is, and that goes into trust. All right? Are you a person that's real shady? Are you trying to publish something and you'll even lie about your stats to get it published? All right? Have you heard of that in academia before? I have. Uh, it's not pleasant. It's very ugly, but some people get like, I'll just kind of make up these results and nobody knows stats and so they don't know what I'm doing. Well, other people do know stats and they will try to verify that and check out, replicate it. And if they can't, you know, you can say you produce cold fusion, but maybe you didn't. <laughs> or maybe there were some constraining things, but if they don't trust your character, they don't trust you as a believable, trustworthy person, then you're not going to have credibility with it. Now, how many people that you just love to death, but you didn't think they did a thing about what they were talking about? <laughs> have you ever had somebody in, like, teach you how to do something and you realize two seconds in you know more about it than they do? All right? Or you go, you know. Somebody teaching you how to snow ski or something. You go, hey, you know, how do you do this? 
Well, you don't laugh, and you go, you don't even know. You're just, you're just saying what you think, but you don't know. I mean, you've been around people before. You talk to people on the phone. They have a question about this. Oh, I'm so glad I'm going to help you. And you can see they, they want to help. They have a good heart. They have a good motivation, but they are absolutely clueless about how to fix your laptop that just broke or whatever. You know more about that than they do, and you're calling them very well. All right? So you have credibility if you can do it. Now, you can do it. If they think you're lying to them, you don't have credibility. See what I'm saying? So it takes both of those contracts. Can I trust you? Are you a virtuous person? And are you lying to me or not? Now, I would add in this last one as well, a concern for the well-being of the audience. When you're trying to persuade somebody, are you trying to do something that will help them? Or are you trying to do something that will help you? You know, I get these calls all the time. I'm calling my blessings. What a hard way to help <laughs> you have to figure out when people are eating and then call them. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you're in your doorbell and you're doing something. I got a call on my phone today from somewhere. And I thought, how'd you get my cell phone? I'm not even going to pick up because if you're a telemarketer, you won't leave a message. <laughs> so I didn't. So I got this thing on my phone. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get that one out. See that came from. I think I know about it. So, character competence, character competence, credit. You can have it if you have both of those. Let me ask you this, and we don't have time to do this, but I'm going to ask you. Have there been times in the past where there have been major science fails? So I'll go and I ask these people over here to think about what are people's attitudes, values, beliefs about science in general. Have there been historical things where science has said this and it turned out not to be that? All right. So if you know that about people, and you know where they're coming from, you can kind of understand. If you say something to them about climate science, and they go, oh, this is kind of like these bleaches to help cure these things. So if you see people that have a whole perspective of science like that, you can see where they might come from a, a, a position where they might not be real eager to hear what you taught. I have a colleague here at Tech that tells me he works with people who work on the farm. And the science people from tech will go tell them, hey, you really need to do this. And the farmers go, no, that's not good. I own this land. I've been doing this for years, and I've been doing well that work. And they're doing it here in tech. They're doing all this crop science, and they figured out how to do things, and the farmers won't believe them. And I thought, how interesting. So you have to know where your credibility is in a particular topic especially in something like climate science. And all right, third area that I want to look at. Third question. What do you do if somebody really, really, really disagrees with you and you are trying to persuade them? All right? That's the toughest. Actually, that's the toughest and the most persuasion of all is if you can get somebody who doesn't believe in what you're saying, and by the time you're through, at least they're neutral. Or at least they think there may be something to that. That's the most awesome persuasion. It's hard. It's the hardest persuasion, but it's the most awesome persuasion. Uh, so they just disagree with you. Well, one of the things you might try to use with them is to show them that they really, really disagree. Well, are you with this? Do you see these numbers? Are you with that? Are you with that? I have to tell you. So Remember, I do social science research, and so for years and years and years, I would work with graduate teaching assistants, and I would say, you need to look like a teacher. I'm not going to tell you what that looks like, but you need to be professional, dress professional, act professional. You do not party with your students. You absolutely do not date your students, all right? So I would say all those things. And I would say, you know, be professional as a teacher. I doesn't mean you have to wear a tie every day, but you need to look like a teacher. And they go, oh no, we need to look just like the students because they'll believe us more if we're more like one of them. Not like a teacher. Let's look like a teacher. Not like a teacher. I asked my wife, I said, you know, I'm not sure. She was in general. He sat in my large lecture class. I just looked like one of them. She goes, what did you put it in? I'm trailing in there. Undergraduate car, long time ago. And so I thought, well, huh, let's just do a little research on that. So I did a research and probably had to look at the students' responses to how their teachers were dressed, particularly how their teacher graduate teaching assistants were dressed. 
and how, what impacts that had on class, not only on cognitive learning, affective learning, likelihood for misbehaviors, the whole works. Now, I did number crunching on that. What do you think I found? What do you think I found? Hmm. Well, it just so turned out that the students who looked at teachers that were dressed just like them, or just kind of slobbed out to teach because they really didn't think it mattered. Cognitive learning, affective learning was lower. The likelihood of student misbehaviors like skipping classes or why do I have to do this or texting during class or whatever was a uh, soft thought. So I came back to my grad student concept. <laughs> Go take a bath. Go take a bath. I'm telling you, take a bath. Right. You clean up a little bit. I don't care if you wear a tie or not, but I do think you need to look at the teacher. I said, look at the numbers. Well, they may not believe the numbers for a variety of reasons. They may say, well, you throw that data and that logic at me all day long. I don't care because I don't believe your numbers. I think you've got some error variants there. <laughs> You know, you must have conducted your research in a weird way that got you the outcome you were looking for. So I don't buy your data. I don't buy your logic. Now, I do in that particular case. I keep showing it to them and saying, hey. So it occurs to me in this last question, what if people really disagree with you and you're trying to persuade them? Ah, it may be that persuasion involves more than data. So you just shove numbers in front of their face and charts in front of their face and then say, poof, you can take that all away. Not super I'm still not persuaded. So it occurs to me, and frankly to some rhetorical theorists, that it may be more than that. I put this in, I thought this was pretty profound because I wrote it. Um, persuasion may be strongly affected by something or something other than your persuasion argument. Now, I'm all about your persuasion arguments. I'm all about that. You build your case, you defend it, you justify it. If there's holes in it, you better have an answer for it. Particularly if you're defending your dissertation or whatever, you got to get your stuff right. I'm all for that, but I think with persuasion, particularly on topics like this, climate science, or other topics that might be controversial in nature, you're going to have to go past that. Here's how you don't go past that. This is not persuasion. All right. Do you see that? Do you think good arguments are being used? Oh, I bet they are. Some really good arguments are being used. How much persuasion is going on? You know, most, most of you have probably been to other countries where they speak a language different than yours. And I remember growing up, I was a stupid little high school kid, and I was in another culture, and I was trying to, to go to the store and buy something, and, and I realized that the clerk didn't speak the same language. So to try to compensate for that, I repeated the same request as trying to buy a toothbrush. I went all the way to that country and forgot my toothbrush. So I'm going in the store trying to buy a toothbrush. I said, do you have a toothbrush? And I could tell very quickly they didn't understand English. So in a very brilliant moment of epiphany, I thought, well, I'll just say it properly. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't. It did not. All right. So you can increase your volume. That's not persuasive. In fact, if anything, it shows you that you're losing it. You're losing the argument if you're raising the volume. If you're getting shrill, if you're doing ad hominem attacks, which means you're starting to say, who does your hair? Did you dress yourself? Were you raised by wolves? You know, you start saying stuff like that, that shows that you're not being persuasive. If anything, you're probably hurting your argument. Hostile? That doesn't persuade. If it did, people would do it all the time, right? Hey, you don't believe me? Just get hostile. Well, when you got hostile, that's the news. I'm persuaded. I know what you mean. I'm right there with you. All right. So that's these are not persuasive things. All right. So well, what persuasive things would you have that might could be done in a better way? Well, if they really, really don't believe you, you know, and you start yelling at them, this is what you're going to get, right? You're going to get. Uh, and all of a sudden, you don't engage with them anymore. I've heard there was an old song years ago that said we both can't be wrong. <laughs> you know that song? Kind of clever. All right, so how about some rhetorical theory that might help us if somebody really, really gets what they're talking about? Kenneth Burke is a noted rhetorical theorist. 
And he said something I thought was very, very interesting. The progress of human enlightenment, enlightenment can go no further than in picturing people not in vicious, but as mistaken. Right? Think about it. The process of human enlightenment can go no further than in picturing people not as vicious that disagree with you, but simply as mistaken. Take a look at these pictures, right? I didn't know how big the brain would be. Over here, you have a cartoon. Virtually every science in the world, and they're looking at a climate denier, and they're saying either he is that dense or he doesn't believe in gravity. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And over here, you got a Newsweek WEAK saying, "Huh, climate science, new science." I'm just kidding. Global warming, trust us. This side. Do you see what's going on with these two sides? They've gone past some of the arguments and they've gone into denigrating or being louder or shriller to the people from the other side. How much persuasion is going on? Probably none. Now, this this position over here makes all these people say, yeah, over here, yeah. It makes everybody that's in your camp already pretty happy, but it's not doing anything to persuade. And so the process of human enlightenment, seeing the other people not necessarily as threats or vicious, but as some people that may may not understand. That's a whole different way of persuading people. A whole different way of persuading people. A little bit further, persuasion is typically seen as rhetoric. They're similarly defined. Um, I thought this was kind of cool. If you look, if people really don't believe in what you're saying, a little bit that's my account. Wow. What well, essentially that means is a good man speaking well. That's how Quintilian, who was a Roman orator, persuade a good person. Okay, a good person is speaking well. A good person, that means you trust them. You think, hey, I don't believe you, I have a different perspective, but at least I know you're not conspiracy trying to sneak up and rob me. You're not trying to pull the wolf over my eyes. And you're speaking eloquently in such a way that doesn't denigrate somebody that disagrees with you, right? You can speak to a, a conference, and if I told an Aggie joke in here right now, there'd be an Aggie in here that might be offended. So you just know not to tell them, right? <laughs> I have a whole story about that, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Here's what Kenneth Burr says, and I think it's very interesting. You persuade a person, he said, man, you persuade a person insofar as you talk his language. Can you speak the language of the other person? And I'm not talking about English and Spanish. I'm talking about region of the country, attitude, cultural beliefs, that sort of thing. Can you speak that person's language? With what you're trying to persuade them, because if you can't, you're further down the road to being able to make inroads. Talking their language by how you speak, by how you gesture, by how you do your attitude, by how you identify your ways with that person. Ooh, let's talk about that. You ever heard somebody say the comment before? I really identify with them. You heard that before? Identification is a powerful concept. What are you saying? When you're talking about identification, remember junior high? Remember how everybody wanted to dress like everybody else? <laughs> remember that? You look at this picture here, and you see a little guy right here that identifies with Spider Man, and he wants to be like him, and he has similar value systems. I identify with him, I have commonality with him. I want to be like that person. Little Disney princesses, we go to Disney World and they see the real Ariel. Or whatever they want to be like. I remember being abroad one time in the country, South Africa, and I was driving through South Africa, and they all had different cars. <laughs> and I saw a Ford pickup. A Ford pickup truck. I don't even drive one. But I know Ford. Hey, Ford pickup truck. We can talk. We can understand one another. You see the point? If you can establish identification, even if they don't agree with you, if there's some areas where they do, I know how these people think. You ever see Anne of Green Gables? If you haven't, that's fine. There was a concept in that movie called Kindred Spirit. You ever run across another person you for the first time and think, I'm going to lie just fine. You and I, we are lying the same. 
So identification, the ability to be similar, the ability to understand how they talk, how they think, uh, what is their belief system, their patterns of thinking, and what have you. Identification leads towards something called consubstantiation, which is another concept uh, that Kenneth Burke writes in his rhetoric of motivation. Consubstantiation. Remember the new consubstantiation? Consubstantiation. All right. What this means is a sharing of substance. Okay, so when you identify with someone, you share substance with them, which means they're going to listen to your persuasion and talk a lot more than you than if you didn't share substance. Let me, let me get it to you in a, in a, a graphic of a Venn diagram. Do you use Venn diagrams? Show relationships if you're like correlation to regression. Here's two different people, and they're different, and there is no sharing of substance. If you're crunching numbers, you're saying, how much shared variance do they have? None. What's an R squared on that? I don't know. It's a big R squared. Doesn't look like much. I don't know if that'll publish. You better do your dissertation. You can find something else. All right, so instead of that, what about this? When you do the Venn diagram and you see what's in the middle. Here's what's different in that variable. Here's what's different in that variable. Here's where the variables overlap. Those of you that don't know if you run correlation regression data, Pearson's, you do some of that. This is your R squared right in the middle. Here's your variance accounting for. And the more of that you have, the more when you wiggle one of the variables, it wiggles the other variable, right? That's a goofy way to say it. But that's true with people as well. And if you identify with them, the way they think, the way they talk, the way they reason, and you identify with them, then you're going to share more substance with them, and they're going to be more open to your persuasion than if you don't do it that way. Remember the yelling people a while ago? That is not shared variance. You see what I'm saying? So what we have to do when we're persuading something, somebody that has a radically different perspective than we do, is learn how to identify with them. You know, and I think you're wrong, but I can identify. If somebody said that to me, I think I said it as well. I took a picture of some veterans in World War II. And I thought, you see a lot of differences between these gentlemen? Differences in race, differences in where they were from, differences in outfit. And every single one of those guys went to battle at a certain time, and so they identified with people. You ever thought of how tough it might be to be very elderly and nobody knows what you're talking about anymore, other than they read it in the history book? But you lived it, and you're around somebody else that lived it, right? I'm reminded by my wife all the time. She says, "Do not talk to me about pain and childbirth because you don't know a thing about it." I said, "Well, I've read." It. Yeah, but uh, no. <laughs> she said, "You know, if you've had a child and somebody else has had a child, y'all can talk." And she said, "Really." <laughs> the other day, and they did this medical test. So and she said, "Don't talk to me about being embarrassed in exams. Women have exams all the time. This, you just have to get up. Yours is nothing. <laughs> they gave you a shot for crying out loud, and you're embarrassed. What? You know." And I thought, "Hmm, because I can't share that substance. I can't understand that at the deep level. But if I can understand that at the deep level." then I'm going to be more persuasive. Does that make sense? And so when you look at people and you say they violently disagree with each other, you can get shrill, you can yell at them and whatever if you want, but you're not doing any persuading. You can watch the TV and watch the little, little rallies and people that beat each other out of the rally on the street. How much persuasion do you want? None. Absolutely none. Everybody's just yelling and getting angry and calling names and whatever. And I thought, if you're really into doing persuasion, you're going to have to think. Who came to the party and what did they bring with them? All right. Why would they want to listen to you? What is your credibility virtuously or competently? I can use that word. And then thirdly, what about my identification? Even if I don't agree with them, what about my identification? And so if you look at these three things that we've looked at, there's rhetorical theory and principles that address every single one of them. So if you want to be effective persuader, you're trying to find the science. This is something you're going to have to talk about. Now, if you go to a conference and everybody else in the room is climate science, 
and you're preaching to convert it, aren't you? But if you're trying to get other people to believe like you, then and you want to be a good communicator, you're going to have to find ways to deal with that. You know, I dealt with a certain man. I'm not going to tell you which was on campus. I spent five years on a committee with some people on the topic that I totally disagree with. Um, but after I spent five years with them, I thought, you know, I, I still disagree with you on that topic, but I'll, I respect you as a middle scholar. I like uh, the scholarship that you do, and I know why you think what you think. Right? And at first, I thought, how could you think that? And I thought, I know why you think what you think. I still disagree with you, but I like you as a colleague. And I'll try to be respectful and treat you with dignity and mutual respect, which by the way can be a time today to see what I'm saying. Treat somebody with dignity, with respect, with I, I kind of hear where you're coming from, and it was hard for me to at one time. This or not. But that's how you become an effective communicator, is when you realize that part of persuasion is not just that you do. You do. Thank you for listening. Enjoy your time. Now I will say wait to Johnson. I think he just got pulled out.